Today, qualia, the knowledge arguments and objections to it. Uh, we're getting on to general problems for physicalist views of the mind of the sort that we've been looking at. Uh, we looked last time at a kind of revamped identity theory that's trying to make the best of uh, the previous physicalist and uh, physically, uh, physicalist motivated theories that went before. But qualia, uh, which we'll talk about today, seem to be a problem in general for physicalist theories. Uh, and we'll look at the knowledge argument this week, very famous argument by Frank Jackson, an Australian philosopher. Uh, and we'll look at Chalmers' um, zombie argument next week and also the uh, what is it like to be a bat argument of Nagel's. So what are qualia? So we've got a couple of quotes here. This is from Bloch. He, he, was, he was drawing our attention to this issue with his Chinese nation objection to functionalism. Um, he says, you ask, what is it that philosophers have called qualitative states, like the state you're in when you're seeing red? Uh, I answer only half in jest. As Louis Armstrong said when asked what jazz is, if you've got to ask, you ain't never going to get to know. Um, so there's something weird about qualia. They're kind of hard to talk about. Uh, and yet, for people who focus on them, they seem very uh, important. Daniel Dennett argues that qualia don't exist. And then others, uh, like Wilfred Sellers, uh, quoted in, in Dennett's book, uh, say things like, hey, Dan, you know, qualia are what make life worth living. If you didn't know what the blue cheesiness taste of blue cheese was like, or the reddish of a, reddishness of a, of a red sunset, uh, the particular zesty taste of an orange, uh, and so on, uh, the suggestion is here that, we, that life wouldn't be uh, worth living in some sense. Nagel, in the article we'll read for next week, uh, what is it like to be a bat? Uh, without consciousness, or qualia, we'll say here, uh, the mind-body problem would be much less interesting. With consciousness, or qualia, it seems hopeless. So what are qualia? So in one of the articles that you were asked to read for this week, we've got a different Lewis here, uh, Clarence Lewis. And we'll just go over the characterization he gives of qualia. And then we'll see how it might differ later on uh, from uh, different people's uh, characterizations of them. And this is part of the, the issue with qualia, is just that they're so uh, difficult to characterize or, or talk about in general. Okay, so he, he talks, talks about them in this way. Recognizable qualitative characters of the given, uh, which may be repeated in different experiences. He thinks they're sorts of universals, and he calls these qualia. So the qualitative characters of your experiences uh, in different uh, situations and in different modalities, uh, in vision and in hearing. We often focus in uh, the mind-body problem, in particular, a lot on visual experiences. Um, but it also applies to the other modalities. OK, so he thinks that um, although qualia are universals in the sense of being recognized from one uh, experience to another, they must be distinguished from uh, the properties of objects. The quail or the quale uh, is directly intuited, given, and not the subject of any possible error, because it's purely subjective. So in the way that you could be mistaken about whether there is an orange on the table in front of you, uh, what you can't be mistaken about, um, because you could be hallucinating, or uh, it might just be something else, uh, and you've mistakenly identified it as an orange. But what you can't be mistaken about on this sort of view is whether you're having a qualitative experience as of seeing an orange object. You're having an orangey experience, uh, and you can't be mistaken about that. If you say, if I say to you, there's no orange there, you're hallucinating. Uh, you might be disturbed, uh, but you might end up being convinced of that. But it's not clear what sense it makes for me to say to you, uh, no, you just imagine that you're having a really vivid RNG experience. So it just seems to be purely subjective in that way. So he picks out these uh, criteria or characterizations, let's say, uh, for uh, qualia. And we'll just go over uh, each of them uh, briefly. So primitive and subjective. Um, the idea here is that with a, a visual representation of something like a coin, 
uh, you might have a subjective uh, ellipticality, so it looks elliptical uh, to you. That's your, your qualitative experiences as of seeing something uh, elliptical. Uh, but of course, we know that maybe objectively it's round. Um, so different qualia. Um, you might have different qualia from the same uh, objective uh, object with objective properties. Um, and likewise, of course, you might have the same qualia from things that are different objective properties. So you might see an actually round or circular coin from an angle, and it looks elliptical. You have the qualitative experience of ellipticality. Then you might also have the exact same uh, qualitative experience from looking at something that actually is elliptical. Okay? Uh, those would be indistinguishable to you in terms of just your qualitative experience. Okay. Uh, directly uh, apprehensible, uh, immediately given in introspection. So that's what I talked about a moment ago. There's room for error when we're talking about the objective properties of the thing. So you might have an illusion where you see these things where people paint on the sidewalk or something, on the footpath, uh, and uh, it looks three-dimensional, like there's a hole in the footpath that you could fall into. Uh, or they might just do something simple, uh, like uh, have... Uh, something that appears uh, as a circular coin, but in fact, when you get closer, you find that this, uh, the object, the actual uh, uh, painting or drawing on the footpath is elliptical. So we can have all kinds of uh, room for error with respect to these objective properties, but not the subjective experience. Epistemically basic. Now, this relates to a larger view in the philosophy of mind, but we won't talk about that. The idea is just that um, qualia are supposed to be the immediate objects of uh, perception. Now, some people will go further and say that that's all we ever uh, can say we perceive, strictly speaking. But we don't need to do that here. Um, we'll just say that uh, it might be possible to perceive external physical objects, but we always do it uh, immediately through, as it were, uh, our qualitative experiences or our qualia. So the only thing that we're directly aware of is just the qualitative experience we're having as of an orange round object in front of me. And then it may be true also that I get to have a perceptual experience of the orange uh, via that uh, qualitative experience. Okay, diaphanousness, transparency. Um, we won't read through all of this. I'll post it later and you can read it yourself. I'm just pulling out a quotation here from uh, George Moore. Uh, but the idea here is that if you try to draw your attention to one of your qualia as the immediate object of your perception, so just focus on your qualia. Uh, I put an orange on the table here. I ask you not to focus on the orange, but just on your qualitative experience of orangeness. Okay? The idea here is that that qualitative experience, your qualia of orange, uh, oranginess, seems to be transparent or diaphanous. You see through it to the actual object. Okay, so it, even though we, on some views of qualia, only have immediate perception of the qualia and only immediate uh, perception of any external objects, nevertheless, our qualia seem to be transparent so that we look right through them. Now, Moore is suggesting here that uh, if we introspect carefully enough, we can focus just on the qualia itself. But it's quite difficult to do. Ineffable. OK, so this is part of the problem about trying to express what qualia are. Uh, there are no concepts, Lewis says, of immediate qualia as such, because um, what does not affect discrimination and relation has no handle by which the mind can take hold of it. So. It's just a general problem about trying to express exactly uh, what it is that we're trying to express when we're talking about qualia. Intrinsic and non-relational. So a long quote here. He says, all that, we can, all that can be done to designate a, a, a quale or quail is to uh, speak, uh, is, so to speak, to locate it in experience. So just to designate the conditions of its reoccurrence uh, or other relations of it. Uh, now, that location doesn't, he thinks, uh, touch the, the quale itself. Um, if it could be lifted out of that network of relations and the total experience of the individual and replaced by another, uh, no social interest or interest of action would be affected by that substitution. 
So we'll talk more about this kind of idea next week when we look at the zombie argument, which is related to this inverted spectrum argument. So the inverted spectrum, the idea here is fairly simple, uh, and it's part of the general uh, non-physicalist uh, attack on uh, physicalist views like uh, physicalist versions of functionalism. That if when I come to the traffic lights and I see the top light is on, uh, and you come to the traffic lights and you see the top light is on, we both stop, and then we both go when the bottom light is on. Uh, now, when I see the top light on, I have the experience that, let's say, we all agree uh, is red. We, we, I mean, I'll call it red, you, but whatever experience you're having, you'll call your experience red. But I have a qualitative experience of reddishness. But when you see that top light on, because our uh, spectra are inverted, you'll actually have a qualitative experience uh, as of greeniness. Okay. And then when you see the bottom light turn on, you'll have a qualitative experience as of reddishness. I'll have a qualitative experience, the normal one, as of greenishness. Uh, but we can never discover this difference about ourselves just, say, by uh, discussing it or reporting it to each other and comparing uh, behaviors and so on. Because you'll always stop when the top light is on, and I'll always stop when, the bo uh, uh, when that light is on. We'll both go when the bottom light is on. Um, so our spectra are just inverted, but that doesn't make any uh, functional difference to us, by hypothesis at least. Uh, so no social interest uh, of action, say, would be affected by this substituting of one uh, qualitative experience for another, as long as it was done systematically. Um, Okay, so that's supposed to be another feature uh, here. We're just focusing on how uh, it's intrinsic like that. It's not um, relational. It's not dependent on its relations to other uh, things. Universal, so what he means here, uh, again, is just that it's recognizable without any kind of inference, okay, uh, through immediate um, acquaintance with it uh, and indubitable comparison, as he puts it. And they're also, uh, qualitative experiences or qualia are also supposed to be homogeneous and uh, simple. So they lack structure or parts. Part of the idea here that some people will have is that they're, as it were, atoms of conscious experience. Okay, so that's a lot to take in, but uh, it's, what we're trying to do is just put a little bit of flesh on this idea of qualia. Uh, we don't necessarily have to buy everything that Lewis is trying to sell us here in trying to characterize them. Many people who are, as Jackson will put it in a moment, qualia freaks. They uh, are really into qualia and they think it's really important. Uh, they won't necessarily agree with all of these characterizations of qualia, but it just gives us an idea uh, for the moment of uh, what people are trying to pick out when they're talking about uh, qualia. Any questions about qualia for now before we move on to the problem that they're supposed to pose for physicalism. I mean, it's so weird in a sense because uh, if the people who are qualia freaks um, are right, then qualia really are one of the most important parts of our uh, lives, and yet uh, we can have trouble when it comes to actually articulating uh, and understanding what those uh, things that are supposed to be so important uh, are. But the idea is we're supposed to be intimately familiar with them, right? Um, you take the milk out of the fridge in the morning, uh, pour it over your cereal, it turns out it's completely sour. You have a particular qualitative experience there, um, as opposed to another qualitative experience like drinking a perfect flat white, like every flat white that everybody ever serves to anybody in Melbourne, miraculously. You can't even get a proper one in the entirety of North America. I've tried. Uh, and you have that lovely qualitative experience now. Uh, so these things are supposed to be intimately familiar to us from everyday life. Okay, so what's the knowledge argument then? The no knowledge argument is trying to leverage this idea of qualia and say that they uh, are a problem, a big problem, for physicalism in general. And in fact, uh, they refute physicalism. They show that maybe the guy we've been dismissing right from the very beginning here, Descartes, maybe wasn't so wrong after all. Uh, that maybe we can't be monists about the mind. Uh, maybe we have to be dualists of some kind. Okay, so uh, you read, hopefully, in the article, Jackson's article, 
um, the story of Mary the colorblind scientist. So she's in a, a room, a uh, black and white room. Uh, somehow she can't see herself or she's also black and white. Uh, and she has access to all of the physical information. Let's say physics is finished, as it were. We've got it all written down. Uh, and we've got everything in biology written down and in neuroscience written down. And they're done, those sciences. Uh, so you, she has access to all of that information uh, about other people and the goings-on uh, outside her little room in the world by cameras and so on. Um, and in particular, she can even focus on what's going on in people's brains when they see red, say. But then one day, she gets out of the room, uh, finally, and she sees, uh, let's say, a rose that she knows, or some other red flower that she knows is red, and she says, wow, that's what it's like to see red. The idea here, roughly, is that she learns something new by being let out of the room. And if that's true, then it seems like uh, by being in possession of all of the physical facts, she nevertheless wasn't in possession of something uh, else, some other fact that she learned when she left the room. Uh, and so if you've got some other fact that she learns when she leaves the room, then all the physical facts are not all the facts about the world. And physicalism can't be a complete description of everything. OK, so the question here, here's Jackson, another famous Australian philosopher. Um, the question here, of course, is will she learn anything uh, when she leaves the room? He thinks it's just obvious that she will learn something about the world and our visual experience of it. In particular, she'll learn something about all the people that she was looking at before. She'll learn something about what was uh, a fact about them and their experience that she didn't have access to before. Uh, so you can state the argument uh, in a, a careful way. This is a, based on uh, a restatement that Jackson uh, published in a later article uh, that was then qualified a little bit by inserting a, a missing premise uh, by Robert Van Gulick. Uh, later on. But this is essentially um, Jackson's argument here. So simple argument, uh, and it's nice to see a simple argument for something really complex. Uh, so premise one, Mary, before she was released from the room, uh, knew, we just stipulate that, that she knew all of the physical facts, everything physical that there is to know about seeing red. Premise two, Mary, before she was released, does not know everything that there is to know about seeing red. Why? Well, because she learned something about it on her release. Therefore, um, let's say as an interim conclusion, there are some truths about seeing red that escape the physicalist story. And then generalizing from that, uh, physicalism is false and phenomenal properties or qualia uh, can't be explained as or identified with physical properties. So that's the argument. And it all hinges on how we answer the question, did Mary learn something when she left the room? And then, of course, we have to assess what it is exactly that we're claiming that she learned. Any questions so far? So of course, we're trying to refute something here, uh, at least Jackson is, uh, physicalism. So we have to get a little bit clearer about what physicalism uh, is. So just drawing on what Jackson says, um, we have a strong reading of physicalism here in mind. So he says that physicalism is not the non-controversial thesis, that the actual world is largely physical, but the more challenging thesis that it's entirely physical. So it's the claim that if we did have finished physics, biology, neuroscience, etc., and all of that was supposed to uh, make up an entire physical description of the world, um, that that is all that there is to know. And it's a wide sense, as what I just said uh, indicates, a wide sense of physical, because it includes everything not just in completed physics, but also chemistry, neurophysiology, and so on and even the causal and uh, relational facts um, that uh, follow from that. Uh, 
including, say, functional roles and so on. So it's a fairly wide conception of uh, physical, uh, and it's the claim that the world is uh, entirely physical or physically describable uh, in, in those senses. Now, just as a very brief aside, I'll note here that there's a poignant problem in philosophy of mind and the mind-body problem. Everybody focuses on, uh, well, what, what's the mind anyway, right? And is it you know, consistent with uh, the physical world or is it entirely describable by the uh, in physical terms? Here we're focusing a little bit, getting some sense at least, uh, about what physical is supposed to mean. But the poignant problem is that uh, if you define physical uh, as what our current uh, sciences, even wide physical sciences beyond physics, uh, currently say, then physicalism is almost certainly false. Because those sciences may be mistaken in various ways and they're not finished. But if we define physicalism in terms of whatever the finished sciences will say, then we don't know what it says, because we don't know what those physical sciences will look like. So it's a general problem that's always in the background when you're talking about physicalism, but uh, it's not like we don't have any idea uh, about what it means. Uh, and roughly, we're going to go with this uh, characterization, that the, uh, the world is entirely, in some sense, physically describable in this wide sense of physical. But the problem is consciousness, qualia. If Mary is able to do all of this, uh, describe everything uh, that she's looking at uh, in physical terms, and then learn something new uh, when she leaves the room, it seems like what uh, uh, she learns there is something that was left out of the physical description. OK, now who is this a problem for, more particularly? Well, it's a problem for almost everyone uh, we've discussed so far. Um, and. In particular, it uh, threatens a, a particular view of the relation between the mind and, uh, let's say, the brain or the physical, which is supervenience, Superven supervenience physicalism. So what's supervenience? So, supervenience is the claim, as I put it here, that the mental supervenes on the physical in that things that are exactly alike in all physical properties can't differ with respect to mental properties. So there's this covariance relation between the physical, let's say brain here, uh, and our uh, qualia, qualitative experiences, phenomenal experiences, and so on, uh, mental states in general. But the covariance relation is asymmetric in a certain sense. Uh, so as Kim puts it, there's no mental difference, including no qualitative difference in terms of, uh, of your qualia, uh, without a physical difference. So, it's never going to be that you could have a change in your qualia, if supervenience physicalism is true, without some change in the supervenience base of the physical. But it's asymmetric, this covariance relation, because you can have physical differences without uh, a mental difference. So it may be, I mean, that's multiple realizability for a start, OK? Uh, you could have different physical realization bases for the same mental states, uh, including qualitative experiences. Uh, so the supervenience relation is just asymmetrical in that way. Uh, you're not going to get um, um, any mental difference or qualitative difference uh, in your experience without some physical difference, but you can have physical differences without a corresponding um, mental difference. Now, if the knowledge argument, if Jackson's argument is right, then this uh, claim uh, is, is false. Supervenience uh, physicalism is false. Why? Well, because you end up getting uh, a qualitative difference without a physical difference. It seems like. So that's the problem. OK. so. Jackson, um, the qualia freak. So he asks, is there any really good reason for uh, refusing to countenance the idea that qu uh, qualia are causally impotent with respect to the physical world? Um, so here he's focusing on something else a little bit. It's the epiphenomenalism claim in the uh, article title. So he's arguing for epiphenomenal qualia in a certain respect. So 
Epiphenomenalism here is just the claim uh, that, let's say, qualia here are causally impotent. Um, so he thinks, I mean, he's, he's kind of got a nuanced view on this, but uh, he thinks that they're not maybe causally impotent in a certain um, uh, respect. Uh, all he's concerned with, he says, is, is to defend that it's possible to hold that certain properties of certain mental states, in particular the, quali uh, the qualia of those states, uh, are such that their possession or absence makes no difference to the physical world. I mean, this is consistent with the inverted spectrum idea again. Uh, you could have different qualitative experiences and yet no functional difference uh, about in terms of your behavior. Um, and uh, you might have that difference without there being any physical difference. Remember, if, you, if the supervenience claim is false, then you can have qualitative difference without a physical difference. Um, and then that, in turn, might end up making uh, no uh, causal difference, let, let's say, to the physical world. Uh, so he's only def defending this more limited claim that uh, the possession or absence of qualia makes no difference to the physical world in the way that they wouldn't in an inverted spectrum uh, case. Um, the stronger claim is that the mental is totally causally inefficacious. Um, and for all I will say, he says, it may be that you have to hold that the instanti instantiation of qualia makes a difference to other mental states, although not to anything physical. So he's allowing at least for the possibility, or he's not coming down, strictly speaking, against uh, qualia being causally efficacious uh, with regard to other mental states. Okay, but he's just saying that um, he thinks that they, uh, their possession or absence makes no difference um, presumably including a causal difference to the physical world. So the traditional view of uh, epiphenomenal qualia is something like this. Um, it gets characterized sometimes as, uh, you know, you've got the kind of the train of physical events going along here, uh, and the mental events that are associated with those physical events are kind of just like puffs of smoke out of the uh, engine of the train. It's just kind of blowing this smoke off as it goes along. Uh, now, but Jackson is saying here is that um, whatever this relation is uh, of covariance, it's not supervenience, um, if he's right, but you won't get any causal effect from these mental events, especially qualia, uh, to physical events, but he's allowing for the possibility at least, and I haven't put in arrows there, but you can imagine them, that there may be causation between uh, the qualitative experiences, but just never down to the physical level. Okay. Okay, so he admits here to being what he calls, uh, what he says is a qualia freak. He says, I think that there are certain features of bodily sensations especially, but also uh, of certain perceptual experiences that no amount of purely physical information includes. Uh, and he goes on uh, about various um, examples of this. Uh, give me all the physical information. You won't have told me about the hurtfulness of pain paininess of pains, the itchiness of itches, and so on, uh, the experience of tasting a lemon, smelling a rose, hearing a loud noise, or seeing the sky. It's a photograph of mine, actually, that I took in Tucson, Arizona, when I lived there, biking home one day from uh, work, listening to a podcast, and I uh, wasn't even looking uh, overhead until eventually I did, and I saw that. So I stopped and took a picture. So that's the kind of thing that we'd be missing out on if we uh, didn't have qualia. Um, and it's the kind of experience when you have the qualitative experience of smelling a rose or seeing that sky, that's not the kind of thing that, according to Jackson, that any amount of purely physical information um, can get you. Now, just drawing your attention here to some questions, we're not really going to answer them right now, but I just want you to uh, think about uh, whether the way in which Jackson is characterizing qualia um, is the same as or how similar it is to the way that uh, Lewis was characterizing them. Uh, I think for the, at the very least, for now, we can say that they're both um, private, intrinsic, and non-relational. Uh, remember, intrinsic and non-relational uh, non because um, uh, in something like the inverted spectrum, um, we'd get no functional difference like that. OK, so just drawing your attention to, the, to, to um, whether they're exactly the same or not. 
Okay, so uh, another way of maybe getting a handle on the argument is to think about it from a different direction. So imagine instead of somebody who has been deprived of the ordinary kind of qualitative experiences, uh, like uh, Mary, who's been stuck in this black and white room, we encounter somebody who reports uh, seeing maybe a number of different colors where we just see one. There are actual cases uh, that seem to be like this, and so it's a more realistic case. Um, so Fred, let's say, reports seeing different colors where we just see one, uh, as if he were living in a land of the red-green colorblind. So he just has a much more fine-grained uh, ability to distinguish. Maybe he's got an extra uh, rod or cone or something, uh, and he's just able to see more. He's got extremely fine and entirely nude uh, color discrimination. Uh, you test it to make sure that he's, uh, uh, you know, he's not just making it up. Uh, it seems to be consistent over many trials and conditions. You look at the correlative evidence in the brain and you find that it's supported um, by some kind of um, evidence there. Now, uh, we know everything that there is to know, let's say, uh, in those terms about Fred's discriminatory be uh, behavior, uh, verbal descriptions, brain and body, let's say all of the physical information that we can get our hands on. And so we know and we convince ourselves reliably that he really um, does see an additional color, and so we know that he sees an additional color. But we don't know what it's like. Maybe we figure out how to do an operation on ourselves then, of course, to put that extra cone in our um, eye, uh, and suddenly, uh, like Mary being released from the room, we have revealed to us uh, all of what Fred can see. Uh, and so the idea is, well, you know, even though you knew that he sees an additional color and you knew all of the physical information, it would seem that when you did that operation on yourself uh, that you've learned something. You've learned something new. And if that's right, it's going to be the same kind of problem for uh, physicalism.